Dampness in Buildings and Diagnosis, Module 9 Atmospheric Moisture and Condensation There is broadly a condensation season and this is generally between September and April. If there is dampness outside that period, it is probably not condensation. doesn't say it isn't, it's just probably not, less likely to be. So let's first look at temperature and relative humidity. Don't remember the figures. At 10 degrees, 7.5 grams of water vapour can be resident per kilogram of dry air. At 20 degrees, double the temperature, then 14.7 grams of water vapour can be resident per kilogram of dry air. So the warmer the air, the more water vapour it can retain. Therefore, it's very useful to know how saturated the air is with water vapour. And it's this measure of saturation that is known as the relative humidity. So, in simple terms, the amount of water vapour in the air at any given temperature expressed as a percentage i.e. a proportion, of the maximum amount of water vapour that can be resident at the same temperature is known as the relative humidity. And there's a little equation, actual over maximum times 100% RH. Note that relative humidity is a proportion, as I call it. It's not an amount. It's a proportion. Well, Let's imagine the air as a bucket. We will imagine the air as a bucket. The warmer the air, the bigger the bucket. Conversely, the colder the air, the smaller the bucket. So here's our air at 20 degrees. Here's our bucket, quite big. And in our case, it's 60% full. It's 60% full. What we're going to do now is we're going to cool the air down to 15 degrees. This means our bucket is going to get smaller. But what we're now going to do is to pour the water from the left side into the 15 degree bucket. Now, as a proportion of the volume of the bucket, we have 83%. Same amount of material that was there at 20%, but because the bucket has got smaller, i.e. the air has got colder, the relative humidity has increased. OK, let's do the same exercise. We're going to cool the air to 12 degrees. Buckets got smaller. Pour the material to the left into this bucket. Now our bucket is 100% full. It's 100% full. Same amount of water, material, whatever you want to call it, as we've had all along, but now it's full. We're going to cool the air even further. It's gone to 10 degrees. So now what's going to happen? Well, quite simply, it becomes obvious that if we pour that material into that bucket, some of it is going to overflow. That bucket just cannot hold the amount of material that was there. And this simply, in the air, comes out of the air as condensate. And indeed, the important thing to bear in mind when we're looking at reality is that warming up the air will reduce the relative humidity. Warming up the air will reduce the relative humidity. So in a very cold environment, unheated or poorly heated, we could easily have a high relative humidity, but heat it up to a reasonable temperature for living, that relative will go down to a very reasonable level. And indeed, if we look at the difference in relative humidity, now in this case, we're going to assume the same level of water vapour throughout the building. And we can see this change in relative humidity. Insulation, timber suspended floor. There's the main room. It's 44% RH at 20 degrees. The VP stands for vapour pressure. And this is a direct measure of an amount of water. It's directly related to the amount of water present. So in our hypothetical building, the air is going to move up and down, round and round, and it passes into the subfloor void, and it's cooled to 13 degrees. 
The relative humidity, in other words our buckets got smaller, now increases to 69%. Indeed, the water vapour goes into the roof where it's really cool, it's a very cold day out, to 9 degrees. The relative humidity in that roof space is now 96% relative humidity. Same level of water vapour all the way through. The difference is purely on temperature. So, let's look at it. You're sitting in your office or wherever and you're, somebody comes in and says, look, here's the drawing. I've got these two RH readings, 60% and 70%. Which is the dampest room? The answer is quite simply, you don't know. You cannot say the temperature is unknown. It may simply be a temperature factor. You don't know. This is quite an interesting. It's looking at the external atmospheric conditions because as we'll see in later modules, the external conditions do make significant changes to the internal conditions. So what have we got here? These are relative humidities and temperatures, but note in the colder months, the relative humidities that we're getting outside between London, Manchester and Edinburgh, that's quite a long distance, are all over 80% on average. So we get very high relative humidities externally. And overall, external water vapour does significantly influence, or rather can, the internal levels. So let's have a look quickly at surface condensation. So on the right we've got a cold wall and on the left we have an air temperature scale. And with this cold wall, this difference, we are now looking at air that is what I loosely call in the boundary layer of air against the wall. In other words, a few millimetres against the wall where the coldness in the wall can affect the air temperature. So we we'll start off a little way away from the wall, literally millimetres. We've got an air temperature of 17 degrees and this gives us, under these conditions, a relative humidity of about 74%. But as that air slowly gets really close and starts to come into contact with the wall, it's being cold. The wall's cold. The air temperature very close to the wall is now 16 degrees. The RH is now increased to 84% thereabouts. In other words, our buckets got smaller. And the air gets closer and closer and closer to the wall until it comes into direct contact where it's cooled distinctly by the coldness in the wall and we reach 100% relative humidity. Our bucket is full and any more cooling, the air cannot retain the water and it overflows onto the cold surface and this is how surface condensation occurs. The temperature at which we reach 100% relative humidity is known as the dew point temperature. The dew point temperature. Surface temperatures vary. Different materials vary in their ability to transmit heat and, of course, cold. Dense materials as such as glass, steel, etc., tiles, transmit heat well and indeed cold. Porous open materials do not conduct heat well. They make very good insulating materials because they can maintain a good temperature differential between the warm and cold sites. Coldest areas are usually on north facing walls, possibly east facing, and those walls or places on those walls are most likely to be at the highest risk to surface condensation. On west to southwest walls dampness could be water penetration, this can sometimes occur through cavity fill. And of course, thermal bridging can occur in areas such as metal window frames, concrete lintels, doors, and other structures. So how do we visually assess surface condensation? Well, I think it's fairly obvious. Water droplets on impervious surfaces. These would include paint, glass, plastic, tiles, any impervious surface and they're just two examples there of it occurring and of course we can see it simple other droplets and very evident here one in a hall where somebody continually smokes it's picked up the 
atmospheric tar, for want of another word, and one on the right in a kitchen. We've got water droplets, and you can actually see the little water runs that they've gradually built up. Corrosion runs, if you've got an exposed nail in the paint, you can see where water's run down over it and cause this staining. And the one on the right is subfloor condensate. If that continues, it could be a very, very significant problem. Interstitial condensation. Surface condensation is that which occurs on the surface. Interstitial condensation is where it occurs within the fabric of the building. The drawing there shows interstitial condensation in cavity walls, the bottom drawing. However, it can occur in solid walls. It can occur within a material anywhere, basically, if the conditions are appropriate. One has to remember that water vapour moves. We'll see more of this later. Water vapour exerts a pressure. The higher the amount of water vapour in the atmosphere, the greater the vapour pressure. And it will move down its pressure gradient. And during the colder months, there's more water vapour within a property than outside, simply because of occupation. Water vapour therefore moves out through cracks and crevices, moving down its vapour pressure gradient, but it also moves to the building fabric itself. And what we have, we have the inside here and the outside, and that's a wall. What we have is a wall temperature gradient, warmer inside than outside usually. But we can also calculate a dew point temperature gradient through the wall. And if those two cross, that is the point at which we get interstitial condensation. The condensate is forming within the fabric of the wall. Interstitial condensation is more likely to occur where there is an external vapour check which prevents the passage of moisture laden air out through the wall, dense renders, impermeable external finishes, and where there is a high internal moisture production. Different materials will resist the movement of water vapour to a greater or lesser extent. The higher the figures, the more slowly the water vapour moves. And we can see in this figure, vapour resistivity in free air is nothing. There's no resistance and pretty minimal in mineral fibre. The rest vary. But the important thing to bear in mind about vapour resistivity, it's additive. Each of those, if they were built on top of each other, adds, so it becomes additive and more vapour resistant. Interstitial condensation is a risk, and that risk is determined. It's calculated and not assessed physically, usually. By knowing the precise structure of, let's say, the wall, the thickness and the materials, and so forth, the risk of interstitial condensation can be calculated. And indeed, data on the vapour resistivity is given in a British standard 5250 2011 and a building research digest on 110. So, how is the risk calculated? Well, we put all this data and figures into equations knowing the construction of the wall, its materials, the thickness of the materials, and we can calculate a wall temperature gradient through the wall. Similarly, by use of those calculations, we can also calculate a dew point temperature gradient through the wall, inside and outside. And if indeed those two cross, we then get interstitial condensation. Dampness and buildings in diagnosis, end of module 9.